Summary and Analysis Chapter 30 of Adventures of Huckleberry Finn Summary After the Duke and King board the raft, the King shakes Huck by the collar and asks if he was trying to give the con men the slip. Huck says he was afraid of being hanged and ran at the first chance he got. The King threatens to drown Huck, but the Duke intervenes and tells the King that he would have done the same thing had he been in Huck's shoes. The King cusses the town and everybody in it, but the Duke turns on him again and says that he should be cussing himself for almost getting the two locked up in the penitentiary. The Duke is only grateful that the bag of money was discovered in Peter Wilkes's coffin, which provided an opportunity for him and the King to escape. It is the very reference to the bag of gold that triggers an argument between the Duke and King over how the money got into Peter's coffin in the first place, each blaming the other for wanting to hide the money so he could later have it all to himself. The King, overwhelmed and exhausted, blubberingly confesses that he hid the money in the coffin. The Duke shames him for letting the slaves take the blame. Then the two men take solace in drinking, till they're drunk, mellow, thick as thieves again, and literally sleeping in one another's arms. As the two sleep, Huck tells Jim everything that's happened. Analysis Over the course of the novel, the king has morphed into another pap in Huck's life, debauched and, now, murderous. He is a petty, stupid tyrant, whose power over Huck is restrained only by the duke, who is himself hardly a moral authority. It is the duke who rightly identifies the price of freedom here as the need to take responsibility for oneself, which the king refuses to do. Also, society clearly has backwards priorities. They allow the duke and king to escape because they were excited by seeing gold to which they have no claim. It is hard to say why the king takes responsibility for something he didn't do, hiding the gold, except that maybe he is so morally exhausted that he wants to take responsibility for something, anything. The duke rather nobly condemns the king for letting the slaves take responsibility for his actions. But just as the duke and king seem to grow out of their wicked ways, they get drunk and conspiratorial again. Like Pap, the two con men will always be morally stained. Summary and Analysis Chapter 31 of Adventures of Huckleberry Finn Summary Huck, Jim, and the con men drift downriver for four days, at which point the duke and king feel safe enough to resume their scams in nearby villages, but they don't have much luck in making money and become dreadful blue and desperate. The two whisper in private in the wigwam, which makes Huck and Jim so nervous that they resolve to leave the company of the duke and king once and for all. The king goes up to a village to see if the people there have caught wind of the royal nonsuch. At noon, Huck and the duke, who's been in a sour mood, set out to join the king, only to find him in a saloon getting cusseted and threatened. The duke begins berating the king, maybe for getting into such a bad situation, maybe to buy time in formulating an escape plan from the saloon for the two of them, at which point Huck, sensing his chance, makes his escape. As Huck runs to the raft, he shouts with joy to Jim that they are free. But Jim, Huck soon discovers, is gone. Huck can't help it, he sits and cries. Soon restless, he takes to the road and comes across a boy who tells him that Jim has been captured and taken to Silas Phelps' farm. Huck also learns that it was the king who turned Jim in for $40, using a handbill earlier printed by the duke. Huck considers writing a letter to Tom Sawyer asking him to tell Miss Watson that Jim is at the Phelps farm so Jim can at least be with his family, but decides that Miss Watson would be cruel to Jim for running away and that Jim would be disgraced. Hopeless, Huck rebukes himself for helping Jim at all and feels low and ornery. Huck prays, but no words come, at least not until he does what he thinks is most moral, writing a note to Miss Watson. But as Huck remembers Jim and how good Jim is, he pauses. At last, he rips up the note and decides he's going to help Jim to freedom, even if that means going to hell. Huck never regrets his choice. As Huck makes his way to save Jim, he runs into the Duke. Over the course of their conversation, the Duke tells Huck that the King did indeed turn Jim in. The Duke eventually tells Huck that if he and Jim promise not to turn in him or the King, he'll tell Huck where Jim is. Huck agrees, and the Duke begins to disclose Jim's location, when, mid-word, he changes his mind and lies to Huck about where Jim is. Huck sets out at first for the false place the Duke gives him, 
and once he's sure the Duke is no longer watching, Huck turns around and heads for the Phelps farm. Analysis The Duke and King's moral epiphany is short-lived. Mere days after the Duke gives his speech in favor of taking responsibility for oneself, he and the King, chained to their debauched lifestyle, begin scamming again. Huck and Jim worry because they know the Duke and King have no qualms about harming them if push comes to shove. The Duke, we're later led to infer, is in a sour mood because he helped the King to sell Jim back into slavery by printing a handbill for the purpose, he presumably feels guilty for betraying Huck and Jim. But, ultimately, the Duke values his interests over anyone else's. That's why Huck must be free of him. Even though Huck is at last free of the con men, he can't enjoy his freedom knowing that Jim has been denied his. While it is disgusting that a human life should be ascribed any monetary value, Huck notices that the Duke and King sold Jim out for a rather paltry sum. They made twice as much conning the religious revival as they did selling Jim. This is maybe the most important passage in the novel in terms of Huck's moral development, where the boy decides that he would rather subvert all societal values and do what others think bad than do what society endorses and betray the inclinations of his own heart. Huck thinks that betraying the humanity of good people like Jim is a worse fate than being condemned to hell. Of course, Huck's decision is more Christian and loving in spirit than the alternative, and it is a testament to the way that slavery has warped Christianity in the South that Huck thinks that freeing a man from slavery will send him to hell. The Duke printed the handbill he and the King used to turn Jim in long ago, suggesting that he had at least entertained the possibility of betraying Jim for profit. It is ironic then, that after he earlier charges the King with not taking responsibility for himself, the Duke blames the King and only the King for selling out Jim, even though he is obviously complicit. The Duke is as hypocritical as the society he exploits and defrauds. Summary and Analysis Chapter 32 of Adventures of Huckleberry Finn Summary Huck arrives at the Phelps and feels lonesome, because the droning of bugs and quivering of leaves make it feel like everybody's dead and gone. He says that, generally, such a feeling makes a person wish he were dead too. As he approaches the Phelps kitchen, he hears the wailing of a spinning wheel and wishes that he himself were dead, thinking it the lonesomest sound in the world. Dogs swarm around Huck, but soon a slave comes out and yells at the dogs to scram. The slave is followed by two black children, a white woman, Aunt Sally, and two white children, who, Huck notes, respond to him in the same way the black children do. The white woman welcomes Huck, thinking that he is none other than her expected guest and nephew, a boy named Tom. Huck plays along. The woman who welcomes Huck is called Aunt Sally. She takes Huck inside where she questions him about his trip, such that Huck is forced to lie to keep his cover from being blown. Huck gets especially nervous when Aunt Sally asks him about his family, but is saved when a man, Uncle Silas, enters the room. Aunt Sally hides Huck behind a bed and pretends as though Tom hasn't arrived yet. But Aunt Sally is playing a trick on Uncle Silas, while he's not looking, she pulls Huck out from behind the bed and introduces him to Uncle Silas as Tom Sawyer. Aunt Sally and Uncle Silas question Huck, thinking him Tom, about their relatives, and Huck answers their questions with ease. As they're talking, Huck hears a steamboat coughing down the river. The real Tom could be aboard, Huck thinks, and he could accidentally blow Huck's cover, so Huck decides to meet him. He tells the Phelpses that he's going to fetch his baggage from where he hid it, and heads out. Analysis Huck is finally free, but has no one like Jim to enjoy his freedom with. Alone, then, he experiences freedom as a meaningless blank populated only with the empty sounds of nature, and he would rather be dead than exist in that blank. Just as Huck despairs of loneliness, he is greeted by a microcosm of society. He notices the fact that there is no difference between how white children greet him and how black children greet him, reflecting his maturation into a knowledge of racial equality. Unlike with the Wilkes girls and Dr. Robinson, Huck is again able to lie fluently to Aunt Sally, maybe because he thinks his lies to be in the service of a greater good. In this scene, we also see where Tom Sawyer inherited his boyish love for pranks, family members like Aunt Sally, who here pranks her husband. Aunt Sally's prank is harmless, but as we will see in later chapters, Tom himself hasn't learned how to balance fun with other people's well-being. <laughs>
Note that Huck's impersonation of Tom is similar to the Duke and King's impersonation of the Wilkes brothers. Huck, however, is not exploitative as the con men were. He even feels comfortable impersonating Tom, suggesting that, in his deep, empathetic knowledge of Tom, Huck is most easy and free. Summary and Analysis Chapter 33 of Adventures of Huckleberry Finn Summary As Huck walks to town, he sees a wagon coming toward him, riding in which is Tom Sawyer. Huck stops the wagon, but Tom is afraid of Huck, thinking him a ghost. Huck tells Tom that he isn't, and Tom, satisfied, begins to ask Huck about his recent adventures. Huck tells Tom that he's at the Phelps farm to rescue Jim, and Tom, after thinking a bit, enthusiastically decides to help Huck rescue him. That Tom would help a black slave lowers Huck's opinion of his friend, and he thinks Tom must be joking, but Tom assures Huck that he is serious. Huck returns to the Phelps too quickly after meeting Tom, but Uncle Silas, whom Huck considers the innocentest, best old soul, and who is not only a farmer, but also a preacher, is merely pleased that his mule could go to town and back so quickly. Soon after Huck, Tom arrives. He pretends to be looking for a different house, but, after being invited by the Phelpses to dinner, he accepts. Over dinner, Tom chats and chats, lying very fluently, and at one point he goes so far as to kiss Aunt Sally on the mouth. Aunt Sally jumps up and scolds Tom, even picking up her spinning stick as if to thwack him with it. Tom says that they told her to kiss her. Aunt Sally has no idea what Tom is talking about, but then he introduces himself as Sid Sawyer, Tom's half-brother. Aunt Sally is delighted to see him. Later, one of the Phelps boys asks Uncle Silas if he can go to the show, but Uncle Silas says that, according to the runaway slave, Jim, and another man, the show is scandalous. Huck, realizing that the show must be the Duke and King's, sneaks out of the house at night with Tom to warn the con men. As they're walking, Huck sees a mob with the Duke and King astraddle of a rail, tarred and feathered. Huck feels sick at how cruel people are to one another, and realizes that he couldn't have a hard feeling toward the Duke and King even if he wanted to. As he and Tom walk back to the farm, Huck feels humble and somehow to blame for the Duke and King's fate, even though he knows he didn't do anything. Huck supposes that, when it comes to conscience, it doesn't matter whether we've done right or wrong, because our conscience will invariably make us feel bad. Tom Sawyer, Huck observes, says the same thing. Analysis Tom's first explanation for Huck's appearance is a superstitious one, but he is mature enough to accept Huck's rational account of his adventures. Huck's reaction to Tom's willingness to help points again at society's hypocrisy, Huck thinks that Tom is a proper member of society, which is why he thinks less of Tom for being willing to break society's rules. Huck thinks of himself as a no-good rule-breaker, and so he is okay with himself breaking those rules. Huck does not yet clearly see that it is the rules themselves that are depraved. Uncle Silas is an upstanding member of society and a person whom Huck respects very much, and yet he thinks it acceptable, even moral, to hold Jim prisoner. It's surprising that Huck still thinks he's doing wrong by helping Jim, but, even so, he is much more morally free than Uncle Silas. As Aunt Sally pranked Uncle Silas about Tom's arrival, so does Tom prank Aunt Sally. This sketch of a family shows how behaviors and beliefs are passed from one generation to the next, behaviors as benign as pulling pranks, and beliefs as perniciously serious as the inferiority of one race to another. Despite all the wrong they did him, Huck tries to save the Duke and King from capture, revealing his commitment to freedom for all over even societal justice. Huck also wants to save the Duke and King because he knows how disgustingly cruel people can be. Indeed, the nastiness of the punishment the townspeople inflict on the frauds tarring and feathering is a crime in itself. Huck, in his empathy, forgives the pitiful wretches. Huck's experience of the Duke and King's punishment enables him to once and for all grow out of his enslavement to socialized conscience, which he comes to think of as a bad gauge of whether or not we're actually doing right or wrong. Free of conscience, Huck is better able to follow the intuitions of his heart. Summary and Analysis Chapter 34 of Adventures of Huckleberry Finn Summary Tom deduces that Jim must be imprisoned in a hunt on the Phelps property, based on the fact that a slave, Nat, goes to that hut with human food every day.
Huck is impressed with Tom's reasoning and thinks that he wouldn't trade Tom Sawyer's mind for anything. Tom and Huck begin to devise plans for helping Jim to escape. Huck suggests that he and Tom bring up the raft, steal the key to Jim's hut, and rescue Jim in the night. Tom concedes that Huck's plan will work, but insists that it is far too simple. He proposes a plan which Huck doesn't explain in his book, because, he says, Tom will just change the plan all the time anyway, throwing in flair whenever he can, which is exactly what he does. Huck still can't believe that a respectable, well-raised, ethical, intelligent, kind boy like Tom would help to steal a slave out of bondage, and he begins to tell Tom as much, but Tom hushes him and says he knows what he's about. Huck and Tom survey the Phelps farm and think of ways to bust Jim out of the hut. Tom decides that it would be grand to dig Jim out, which will take about a week. Huck and Tom also follow Nat, who brings food to the hut where Jim is presumably kept. Nat claims that witches have been pestering him and also lets the boys take a look at the prisoner locked up there, who is, as Tom deduced, none other than Jim. Jim greets Huck and Tom by name, which startles N.A.T. He asks how it is that Jim knows who the two are. Tom pretends as though he didn't hear Jim say anything, and Huck and Jim play along, such that the slave is forced to believe that the witches made him hear things. Tom whispers to Jim that he and Huck are going to set him free. Analysis Tom proves himself to be a rational, clever boy. Despite his powers of deduction however, Tom will show that he is dangerously impractical when it comes to making plans, mostly because he is too reliant on ideas of style inherited from his books. Despite being clever, Tom foolishly dismisses Huck's practical plan, which will liberate Jim soon, in favor of a fancier, more romantic plan. Tom's plan may have style, but it requires that Jim be imprisoned for longer than is strictly necessary. In this sense, Tom is being rather selfish. Huck regresses again in his disbelief at Tom's willingness to violate societal norms. We can't help but wonder if Tom is doing so not for Jim's sake, but selfishly, for the adventure of rescuing Jim. Tom's plan is self-indulgently time-consuming. Huck is skeptical but immaturely bows to Tom's decision out of friendship. Nat, whom the boys rope into their rescue plan, is superstitious, a fact that the boys will exploit to save Jim. Of course, they wouldn't have to exploit Nat at all if their plan were more practical. Even though Tom and Huck will needlessly exploit Nat later, here it is necessary that they do so, lest Nat learn that Jim knows the boys, which might compromise the whole rescue attempt. Jim obviously thinks it necessary to trick Nat as well for the sake of his freedom.